Hello, everybody. Uh, welcome to Statistics and Theory. This is Dr. Vahid Aryadust. And in this demonstration, I'm going to show you how to do a uh, boosting regression, which is a kind of machine learning technique in JASP. So I, I would like to say a few brief words in, uh, and provide an introduction to machine learning first before we talk about how to do the boosting. Uh, long story short, machine learning is at the intersection of uh, quite a few other related fields, one of one of which is artificial intelligence, and actually it's subsumed under artificial intelligence. But it also has overlaps with pattern recognition, with data mining, with knowledge discovery and data mining, or uh, KDD, uh, but, and also neurocomputing. Uh, but uh, a lot of people differentiate it completely from statistical analysis. Uh, so a few words about statistics and machine learning because uh, you know most of my previous videos have been about uh, statistical analysis so it would be a good idea to differentiate them and say how they're different. Machine learning is uh, an algorithm that can learn from the data without formal statistical rules. So unlike statistical methods in which you are looking for a probability-based mathematical formalization of the relationship between variables and the data and then generalize it to populations. Uh, in machine learning, you don't have the idea of generalizations to populations. You just want to figure out uh, how to differentiate between different clusters, that's in, in cluster analysis and classification methods, or how to predict one output, and that's the topic of today. For the presentation today. Uh, but regardless of whether you're using machine learning or, or statistical analysis, the aim is to learn from the data. So uh, that's the common feature of machine learning and statistical analysis. Okay, this I find to be quite useful, a table that summarizes the similarities and the differences between machine learning, especially in terms of terminology and concepts and statistics. For example, for machine learning, we have got uh, here under the fourth category, regression, uh, sorry, super, super, supervised learning. Whereas for statistics, we're looking at another concept called um, super, uh, regression. Uh, in addition, for classification in statistics, we have um, another uh, terminology in machine learning, which is supervised learning. And the rest of the story, I mean, you can, you know, take a look at these terminologies to see how they're used. Okay, so I, I would like to now s move to my new slide, uh, another slide, in which we look at the fit statistics. Uh, I think this is going to be something that we will work with quite a little bit because we need these fit statistics in order to compare different models in our uh, analysis. So let's. Uh, first of all, run the analysis in JASP and then get back to this slide and talk about those fit statistics. Okay, so here is the model that I want to run. Of course, the, this the, the data that I, sorry, my computer is a bit slow today. The data that I have uh, used previously in the regression and uh, structural equation modeling is also used here. You can easily find it under uh, this open data set or open menu under data library. If you go down to data library, you will find uh, the available uh, here. Yeah. So you can just scroll down and find structural equation modeling and use that. Um, of course, you, you, you have the freedom to choice any other data sets that you want to use for the analysis because uh, there is a number of them available, for example, the machine learning one, but but honestly, I looked at the machine learning data set, I, I didn't find very useful for this demonstration. Okay, so that's primarily because I'm not familiar with the terminologies used in those uh, data sets. And uh, interestingly, I'm not e familiar either with the terminologies used here. For example, I don't know why what Y1 all the way to Y7 or X stands for, but I would like to just uh, you know, give it a try and to see how our machine learning techniques will uh, pan out. Okay, so let's uh, go to, uh, to to start our machine learning analysis. We should first 
uh, install the machine learning uh, module, which I have already done. Uh, but I think for you, if you haven't done this, uh, you can go to this plus sign and find the machine learning tab, as you see is right here. Then you just click the box. And once you clicked it, it will uh, immediately appear on the toolbar right on top. And from this toolbar, you click on it, and we are going to use boosting, which is the first method of analysis. OK, so first of all, uh, let me say a few words also about boosting. I think, th I think this is going to be quite useful because it provides us with a uh, with a brief introduction to boosting. Boosting is an ensemble learning kind of method. In statistics and also in machine learning, ensemble methods use multiple learning algorithms to obtain better predictive performance than could, obtain, uh, could be obtained from any of the constituent learning algorithms or alone. So uh, ensemble, as the name indicates, means that we use or aggregate quite a few different models together uh, and leverage their prediction power uh, in order to optimize the performance of the analysis. So one of these uh, boosting techniques which I'm going to use today is, is uh, sorry, ensemble techniques is, is called boosting, as I mentioned before, and this is also from Wikipedia. Uh, I just read the first few lines. In machine learning, boosting is an ensemble meta-algorithm for primarily reducing bias and also variance in supervised learning and is analogous to regression, as I mentioned before, and a family of machine learning algorithms that that uh, convert, oops, okay, sorry, it's, it's not a good day for my computer today. Anyway, so uh, that convert weak learners to strong ones. And what we simply mean here is simply is that we want to use an algorithm that reduces the amount of error or bias, uh, they're almost synonym, almost not exactly, and uh, optimize the prediction power of the analysis. And that's why we use an ensemble of different methods um, to be able to get a better uh, model. So I'm going to go back to our analysis window here in JASP and uh, start analysis. I randomly choose one of these variables. For example, uh, let's go with mm, y1. I want to use this as a target. Feel free to use other variables as your target. Now for our predictors, you, we can start from a relatively simp simpler model in which we've got y, uh, oh sorry, y8 moved to the other side anyway. So y1 to uh, all the way to y7 will move, um, so y1 to y7, no? Okay, so I, I, I'm going to stop my computer for a while to see where this problem is and quickly restart it. Thank you. Okay, so y1 to y, um, let's say y8. So now my target variable is basically y2, which is still fine. So my predictors are these. And some part of the results, actually the preliminary parts of the results are immediately populated on the right-hand side. We have things like MSE, uh, validation MSE, test, validation train. I think the most important thing to start with is uh, this graph here, as you see at the bottom. So the data that we have used uh, has been split into three categories or three parts. One is training. The other one is validation, and the last part is testing. For training, you allow the algorithm to learn, uh, so that's why it's also known as learning. You allow your alg algorithm to learn, and what does that mean? It means it learns the relationship between your input, which were those seven variables that I showed you in the previous window, and your output or the target, which in this analysis is Y2. So it learns the relationship between them. Then in, in the validation, by using the validation data, which is actually pretty small here, that's only 12, uh, it tries to optimize and validate and optimize 
uh, the rules that it has learned and make them more precise and accurate. And following that, it tests uh, the precise or more accurate or uh, the optimized rules on a left out sort of sample, which in this analysis includes only 15. Um, so I think one of the uh, limitations of this analysis is that my sample is pretty small. Because for machine learning, we need uh, significantly large samples. But actually, the uh, principles are the same. You, you have to uh, divide your sample into a training sample, into a learning or, or uh, training sample, then a validation part, and then a testing sample. In some analyses, uh, people prefer not to include a validation subsample. So it's always always a training and a testing subsample. Training usually uh, is much larger because you want your algorithm to, to learn well, uh, to learn all the uh, possible relationships between the input and the output so that it will be able to do a great job when it comes to testing. Okay, I will also go through those uh, statistics, don't worry about it, but before that, I think it's important that we go to tables and look at these tables and say a few words about them. We want to get the evaluation metrics and relative influence metrics and perhaps out of the bag improvement, predictive performance and deviance and actually everything that you see here. Uh, I'm going to click on uh, data split uh, preferences. As you see, we 20% uh, of the data has gone to uh, the testing or the holdout testing data as I uh, showed before and our training and validation data uh, in, 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 in what is left which is called training and validation data 20% has gone to validation y you can actually remove this 20% if you like and just make it zero so uh, zero will be to will go to validation but I suppose it's not a very good idea to do that um, so in this, uh, this there's another technique that uh, that's also used in the. Uh, let me show you my report. In this report, uh, which I will leave the link for you uh, in the description box, I've talked about different uh, ways of fitting a, a machine learning algorithm. Here we have talked about. Uh, artificial neural networks and CART or classification and regression trees. But uh, the principles basically apply to boosting regression as well. So we have talked about k-fold as well and you, you can see what uh, how it has been discussed. For this presentation, let's stick with the more uh, common and perhaps the more accurate and precise way of doing machine learning, which is by dividing the sample into training and, and testing or uh, training and validation and testing subsamples. Right, so I think it's a good idea just to keep them as is. For training parameters, uh, this is important to, uh, you know, to remember, it's important to remember that uh, we have uh, some settings here to configure. Shrinkage is one of those important statistics and I, I highly recommend that you keep it as 0.1. A uh, shrinkage, uh, especially sh shrinkage, is especially used in boosting methods and forest-based methods, which uh, is basically used to <coughs> modify the model and optimize it as much as possible. Uh, it's not a good idea to go beyond 0 0.1. Of course, the higher value, the highest value, would be something around one. Uh, but so research shows that the, sh the shrinkage value of 0 0.1 would probably be the best to keep. So let's keep it for the time being. And in the same way, interaction depth uh, and minimum observation in node uh, should be kept at, as, at 1 and 10. Uh, that's also highly recommended. And here we've got loss function. We've got three types of loss functions, which are, which are Gaussian uh, and Laplace and T. Um, you know, when you're doing machine learning, you are working with uh, two sorts of algorithm, to put it in a simple way. Um, so one algorithm is the loss function or the error function. And you want to minimize 
the amount of errors. So you, you need to use a kind of loss function that best fits those errors that uh, will be generated during the analysis. On the other hand, there is another uh, main algorithm, which is here is boosting, and that's to maximize the precision of the prediction. So loss function can be uh, Gaussian or it can be Laplace or T. As to whether which one is the best, I suggest that you can start with a Gaussian algorithm and then move on to Laplace and T because we need to do a model testing. And as you know, in model testing, uh, one model doesn't work. We have to always uh, fit quite a few models. Now I'm going to go to this uh, table that I have created and I suggest that you fit different models and you keep a record of every model that you fit. Uh, this is just you know something very simple you can add on to the columns uh, for example you can include the loss function the seed etc now what is the seed um, we have an option here for seed set seed to one i highly recommend that you set seed to any index that you would like to uh, one would not be a bad idea seed is the initial value that the algorithm uses to uh, start to uh, to uh, estimate the parameters. Um, it doesn't matter what value you choose, first of all, uh, because uh, the algorithm will use that value in order to converge to a uh, accept to an acceptable amount for the parameters that are being estimated. But the important thing is that if you do not have a seed, every time that you fit a model or every time that you start the analysis from scratch, you'll get a different fit. I show you what that means and how that works. For example, uh, here, and I'll explain what these fit statistics mean. Um, we have got a an MSE value of 0 0.48, as you see in this table, right? 0 0.48. Let's keep that in mind. I'm going to remove y1. Okay, so of course we expect that uh, y1 uh, the uh, sorry mse and the rest of the fit statistics will change as you see here on the right hand side and they change now if we bring back y1 into the equation as you see mse is not exactly the same whereas we expected this to be the same uh, statistics the same metric but it's not the same the previously it was 0 0.84 and this time is 0.581. So the analysis is not stable. In order to improve that stability, I suggest that you set the seed to one and keep this uh, for the rest of the analysis. Now it's three, uh, 0 0.302, which is really good. So we have chosen a good seed. You can actually play around with the seed to see which one gives you a better uh, estimate and just fix it there. Now I'm gonna move Y1 again so if I move it and bring it back in, hopefully I'll get 0 0.302. I haven't tested this, but that's my expectations. So the, uh, yeah, MSE changes to 0 0.303, which is not a big change. But now I expect to get 0 0.302, and let's see if that happens. Yes, we got it again. As you see, 0 0.302. So that's one thing that I suggest we should do, uh, keep the seed fixed to a number and then report it in the table that I recommended. Now let's go through these outputs and see what we have to talk about. So I've, I've chosen everything here, uh, plots and the tables. So I'm gonna close the left-hand window and go through these statistics. First of all, a few words about fit. I think this is a very important concept in machine learning and also in statistical analysis as well. So let's see how to make sense of it. There are quite a few different types of fit statistics and they're used to validate or evaluate the accuracy of the model. The first one and perhaps the most recommended one is RMSE or root mean square value, uh, which is basically the uh, root, uh, squared root of MSE, which is the second one. It has been uh, recommended in the available literature, and I will, uh, in the next slide I will tell you how to interpret it. MSE itself is 
uh, stands for mean squared error and it's actually calculated by the average of the squared differences between the original and predicted values in the data set. Then there is another um, fit statistic called MAE and it's percentile or percentage, sorry. The MAE stands for the mean absolute error and it's calculated by averaging the absolute differences between the actual and the predicted values in the data set and if you calculate its percentage you will uh, you will get the absolute um, mean absolute percentage error <coughs> and finally the famous r squared uh, as a rule of thumb the higher the r squared the better and it's or also it's also known as the coefficient of determination so the higher the r squared value the better it is for example if if you have a r squared value of 0 0.8 the maximum of which is 1, by the way, 0 0.8 indicates that your uh, predictors can account for or explain 80% of the variance in your target variable, which is pretty high. But in machine learning, we usually uh, see that people stick with RMSE. Of course, uh, as the field uh, is, is developing pretty fast, uh, there are many different fit statistics that are being suggested and offered if you go to any journal which specifically focuses on machine learning techniques you will see that uh, you know every almost every month so perhaps even in some journals almost every day there is one or two fit statistics that's being offered okay so how to interpret it well the bad or the good news i don't know how to interpret it but uh, the the news is that there are no hard and fast rules in fact i've read some papers in which the authors claim that it's ir irresponsible and even wrong to set some criteria for interpreting uh, fit statistics uh, well the ideal thing to get is to get a fit statistic as uh, pretty close to zero and that's uh, something that we aim for. Um, in some literature you may find that some authors have recommended RMSE below 0 0.2 to indicate a very good model but anything between 0 0.2 to 0 0.5 indicates that the model is still relatively good and you are uh, you can be confident that your predictors can predict your target variable pretty well but if your RMSE is larger than 0 0.5 I think that's going to be some bad news for the model because it means that uh, the, the model is not doing a good job. But again, it depends on what you really want to achieve. For MSC and MAE or MAPE, um, I have not been able to find a very uh, good rule of thumb. Uh, I mean, if you find any, please uh, put them down in the uh, comments section. I'll be very happy to read about it and see uh, how you guys interpret it and what you have found to to be a good rule of thumb for it. But uh, I have re I've read that uh, some people have chosen 0 0.2 again with MAP, uh, PE or MAE, uh, or uh, which means that 20% of the, the uh, prediction is due to error and is not reliable. So the lack of reliability is around 20%. That's another thing. For this analysis, I would like to stick with RMSE. Uh, and this is 50, 0 0.55. It's slightly above uh, the criteria that I mentioned before. Uh, so, since this is just a presentation for demonstration, really, uh, I'm just, uh, I would assume that this is not a terribly bad model. Uh, OK, so if you are still concerned that, well, uh, can I improve this somehow? Well, you could. Why, why, why not going back to the data that we've got and enter the rest of the variables one at a time? For example, you can enter x1 and check RMSE. Uh, it hasn't changed that much, unfortunately. How about uh, entering x2 and fingers crossed it will change. It didn't change. And x3. Uh, I don't think if things go like this, yeah. Well, it got worse, slightly worse, 0.558. Okay, no problem. Um, I'm going back to the results of the analysis. The R squared value is not too bad. It simply indicates that 0 0.631, that's 63.1% of the variance 
in the target variable is explained by our predictors, which is not too bad. But uh, honestly, I would prefer to get a lower RMSC before relying on my, my R squared value. Now, that will be a better uh, si situation. Now, um, relative influences, because this is not a statistical method, instead of regression beta in regression analysis or uh, beta coefficients, which I have discussed in a previous video. Uh, if you have not watched that video, by the way, I will leave a link to this video here, uh, in which I've discussed multiple and hierarchical regression analysis and also beta coefficients. Well, beta coefficients simply mean how much of the uh, of the variance will change in the target uh, target variable if uh, some change happens in the predictors. In this analysis, we have an analogous metric or index which goes by relative influence or relative importance, if you will. And as you see, Y4 has the highest influence, is 36. Uh, oops. Um, okay, let's go back to that table. It's 36.790, which, which means that about the influence of this uh, variable on the target variable is 36%. The influence of the, the next one, Y6, is 29% something, and the rest is 18, 6, almost 7, and 7. And for X3, it's 1.9, almost 2%. And the rest do not really have any influence on the target variable. So this out of the bag improvement or OOB improvement plot is also useful. Uh, where basically it shows the amount of error, see OOB change or out of bag change and Gaussian deviance. Deviance is also another statistic for uh, for the amount of error in your, in your data. So uh, the lower this uh, line goes, line in the graph goes, the better it is. It's just an indication, like uh, a visual summary of the amount of error as you add on more complexity to your model, complexity uh, being measured by a number of trees here. So the number of trees, because this, as, I remem as, as, you, as you remember, this is an ensemble method. So different smaller models, or known each of, each of which is known as a tree, are created to, uh, cre to uh, uh, create a connection between the input and the output. Uh, so then those trees are put together and the average of the errors is estimated. So we have got something around 15 trees is here and that's probably the most uh, reliable model that we can get. Uh, the relationship, as the tr indicated by this line, is not really anything linear. It's completely nonlinear, and it has very a very strange shape. So unlike the linear regression in which you would, you would have a line like this, the relationship is uh, represented by a completely non nonlinear sort of uh, function. In the same way, you can plot the prediction and the actual observed values here and, and then estimate the R squared value which was presented before. The closer these dots to the line, the better it is and the higher the R squared value, okay? So this is another way of looking at the deviance. Like I said, the deviance is uh, another index of goodness of fit and it's a uh, general, uh, it's a generalization of the sum of squared residuals. So the lower the, devi the deviance, the better the model in terms of its fits and performance. And it also shows the same, it tells the same story. The more complex the model gets, for example, at 15 trees, the lower the deviance and as a result, the lower the error of measurement. So what we're looking at in this output is, uh, output above here, is the best model, which is uh, the one which is right here at this point. And finally, the relative importance has been uh, visualized in this way. Let me see if there is anything else that I should talk about here. Okay, one more thing is that you can add the predicted values to data by clicking this. 
because ultimately our goal is to predict y2 using some models. And the predicted value, if you go back to your data, uh, can be found uh, somewhere, in, it should be found somewhere in the data. Uh, y1, y, okay, that's very strange. I, I should actually see that predictive values. Oh, the column name, okay, sorry, I haven't put a column name. So let's call it PRID, which stands for predictive or predicted. And yeah, I think we should be able to see it this time around. Yeah, that's it, let's see right here. So, okay, good. So these are the predictor, the predicted values. If you, if you uh, uh, correlate predicted values with y2, which is what we are predicting right here, y2, and, uh, est and square the value, the, the, the correlation value, you will get the uh, coefficient of determination or the r squared value, which has already been outputted. And so the plot that I showed you before is a plot of this prediction value and the y2 value, which is to the left side. I mean, I'm referring to, um, sorry, th it's a very slow day for my computer. Uh, okay, th this is the plot. So the predicted value is right here on the vertical axis and the observed test values are, are on the vertical axis. And, and that's uh, how you can also uh, plot it or visualize it. So um, let's go back to this machine learning tab here. Uh, I wanna say that in next video, I'll, I'll talk about k-nearest neighbors and random forest, etc., and then I move to classification and clustering. Long story short, machine learning uh, is a non-statistical way of making predictions or doing classifications and clustering. And the most important thing in machine learning is to divide your sample into a training or learning sample and a testing sample. In some analyses, you can also have a validation sample, which is for optimization purposes. And the next step is to use an algorithm to create a link in uh, supervised or regression methods, uh, regression problems like this, this is a supervised method anyway, uh, to use an algorithm to create a link between these predictors and the target. And, and that algorithm in this uh, video was the boosting algorithm, which I use. In the, in the next videos, I'm gonna use other algorithms to create a link between them. And finally, you need to look at the fit or the performance of your algorithm to find out, especially if your, uh, your model that your algorithm created for you is doing a good job in the testing sample. Now, uh, there is a term, uh, overfitting, which some of you might have heard of it. Those of you who have done machine learning, I'm sure are familiar with it. But overfitting means that when your model does a very good job in the training sample, but does a very poor job in the testing sample. In other words, it can learn pretty well in your training sample and uh, create a very good connection between the input and the output or the target and the predictors. But when it comes to testing and verifying, uh, it's learning within the unseen testing sample, it actually does a poor job. That, that's why, what we call overfitting. Um, so in order to avoid overfitting, your sample should be pretty large, as large as possible. I'm afraid, as I said, uh, my sample is not a very large uh, sample, so uh, that's why I still have not achieved a very optimal RMSE. Hopefully, if, uh, if you have a large sample, you'll uh, achieve a better RMSE. Okay, thank you very much for your attention. Um, I hope you find this video useful. Sorry about the uh, slow performance on my, on my computer. I think it's the weekend. That's why uh, it's taking us time to respond. Uh, so please stay tuned in for the next video on machine learning and have a good day.